Okay, thank you everyone for coming this afternoon. Um, this is our first Mixed Methods presentation following the summer. I am going to do a presentation on perceptions and utilisation of two anti-malarials, AL, which they call in Malawi LA, so that's how I refer to it, and DHA piperiquin. And this study was done within the context of a clinical trial looking at safety and effectiveness of the two study drugs. And I was specifically looking at um, how the drugs were perceived and used. So an overview of the presentation, I'll run through the background and then I'll outline the qualitative and quantitative methods separately and then the results section is broken into four main categories, um, the perceived ease of administration of the drugs to the children, I should have explained that these drugs were used in under fives and um, so this is the perceptions of the caregivers who administered them, the perceived strength of the drugs caregivers' understanding of the dosing structure and the reported adherence, and then we'll go on to the discussion and conclusion. So antimalarial adherence is essential for effective treatments. There's a lot of studies that show that poor adherence is associated with treatment failure, although um, modern ACTs are pretty good, even with um, reduced adherence, but even so it's important to um, optimise adherence as much as possible. Adherence is really challenging to measure because um, there isn't an accurate biomarker that can be easily detected and individuals usually know that adherence is preferred and so they're likely to um, report that that's what happened even if it might not have. Um, and they're also quite clever, at, you know, when you use um, say drug recorders on packagings or what have you, they can open the pots at different times or it doesn't necessarily reflect behaviour so it's generally quite difficult to record what they actually did. This study used qualitative methods for um, gaining in-depth information about the experience of using drugs rather than adherence, um, particularly focusing on challenges that caregivers had um, administering antimalarials to children and this information was used to develop a context-specific questionnaire which was rolled out in a household survey. Um, the survey then drew on this contextual information such as what the challenges were so that some level of understanding and rapport could be established within the structured questionnaire. This is an overview of the qualitative methods. There were focus groups held separately with younger and older women and um, men of mixed ages. These focus groups were um, run within the communities and participants were identified by community, uh, community advisory groups which were established by the cl overall clinical trial. Quite a number of the villages within the trial had groups of individuals who were voted to be the basically an in-betweener between the clinical trial team and the community itself. So they delivered information and helped with selecting individuals for particular activities. So the community advisory groups were selected to, um, to choose FGD participants. Obviously there's the potential that the FGD participants may not have reflected all members of the community. They may have chosen friends or families, but as far as possible we try to encourage them to select a representative sample of the community. We also have commun uh, critical instance interviews with uh, caregivers of children who'd recently had fever, so that was children who'd had fever in the last two weeks. And these were selected from a multiple indicator survey which was run across the district. So they had reported fever and the first group were people who had, whose child had reported fever and who had attended a health facility and had received antimalarial drugs. In the health facilities, they would have received the original formulation of LA, which is not dispersible and tastes quite bitter. The second group were women whose children had reported fever who did not attend a health facility and who um, would have then received a rapid diagnostic test for malaria which would have been confirmed positive. So they had reported fever plus a positive test and they had not attended a health facility and these children were treated with a dispersible la within the, within the community. So that's a sweet cherry flavoured medicine that dissolves quite relatively easily in, in water. For the quantitative methods then, a survey was rolled out at household level and this was used to follow up uh, children who were treated within the clinic and they were followed up on the day after treatment should have been completed. 
so it's not on the slide, but of the two treatments, the LA was a, they were both three-day treatments, they would have been followed up on day four. LA is taken twice daily and DHA piperaquine is taken once daily. So the questionnaire had four basic sections, um, looking at demographics, the medication that they received and instructions they received at the clinic, the process of administering it, so that was how they administered it, whether they crushed it or dissolved it, whether they gave the tablet whole and challenges they experienced and any strategies they used to administer the medication. And then packages were examined and then they were asked about um, their daily uh, administration of the drug, so their adherence. So this is an overview of the survey participants. There were 218 participants, so it was a relatively small sample and there were some problems with uh, identifying suitable individuals for recruitment to the study. They were pretty much the same in terms of distribution of male and female and also for age. It seems like there's slightly more in that 24 to 35 month group but it's not significant. And then the same for maternal education. This is an overview of the results altogether and I'll go through each of the parts of this diagram um, bit by bit in the next section of the presentation. And you can see that there are the three kind of main interlinking factors affecting the perceptions and use of the medication, one being the ease of administration, one being the perceived strength, and the other being a uh, level of understanding. And I'll go through each of these now. So obviously what we hope is good understanding, easy to administer drugs, efficacious medicine and good adherence. And actually overall the perception of the drugs was fairly positive, although it was was mixed as well and women in hard to reach villages, I hadn't introduced that concept yet, but villages defined as being hard to reach by the Ministry of Health in the area were more positive, which is potentially linked to their greater difficulty in accessing medication. People nearer the clinic tended to be not quite so positive about it. So one of the, the main themes that arose was to do with the ease of administration or how challenging it was usually, and this was linked to underdosing in various ways. Um, caregivers engaged in various strategies to ensure that their children took medication. Some were positive strategies, such as breastfeeding immediately afterwards so that the child wouldn't be sick. Um, but the caregivers also went to great lengths to describe less positive methods, such as threats, and quite a variety of threats were described, such as threatening to hit them or whip them or call the police and you can see how in some cases that can actually contribute to an increased negativity of perception of health facility care by threatening for vaccinations or what have you if they don't take the medication. Looking at the difference between the original versus the dispersible LA, it was seen from their descriptions that it was easier to give the dispersible LA but that wasn't necessarily spoken directly, you could just see that they, they were less likely to describe or they less frequently described um, using threats or violence to um, administer the medication. I haven't actually included um, physical like restraining or what have you in this presentation, but, but that was also described quite a bit as well, holding the children's arms and legs and getting maybe another caregiver to restrain them while the medication was delivered. Which, as you can imagine, if it's quite bitter and disgusting tasting medication and then you're trying to deliver it to a young child, it's not that surprising in a way that they wouldn't want to take it. And Despite the sweet cherry flavour of the dispersible LA, both groups reported dribbling, spilling and spitting the medication. Once probed, a couple of um, interview participants did say that they felt that the LA was easier to dissolve rather than the traditional method of crushing the medication. Um, but actually quite a good proportion, 11% of participants, just gave the medication to the child to chew or, or swallow whole anyway. And it's possible that the number of tablets was a, was a contributor that was described in one focus group that the participants stated that the children get bored of taking so many tablets. So um, perceived strength was another major theme and I've included the whole diagram here really because it links to almost everything else. The ranges of views were from the drugs being too weak to being too strong and with consequences in both directions. So where medication was too weak we saw overdosing. You can see in this second quote here, the caregiver is saying that you might be told to give the tablets um, in the morning and in the evening, but that they just decide that it's a joke and that they're going to give it three times a day to speed the process up. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, 
caregivers described withholding medication or splitting tablets deliberately because they were scared that the medication was going to be too strong for their child. So um, the perception of strength was linked to understanding really and it led to both under and overdosing and the, the, the risk associated with them is that overdosing may lead to drug toxicity. It's important to point out that overdosing doesn't lead to adverse events. Adverse events are events which are expected at any normal dosing. Um, toxicity can result from overdosing. Um, whereas um, if they underdose, then obviously that might lead to treatment failure and consequent perception of the drugs being too weak. So all of these factors are linked in together. Going on to understanding then, according to survey participants, the majority of them, 99%, said that they had received instructions at the health facility and 98 reported having understood this. So that's, that's pretty encouraging that the health workers were taking the time to, to give out appropriate, or to at least give out some information. But despite that, there were clear knowledge gaps. And I, I like the second quote because the person, the individual who responded, clearly understands the importance of following the instruction and that's the point of their, of their comment. When you don't follow the instruction, you tend to think it's not powerful enough. But when you read on, the, the dosing schedule that he describes is not correct because he says you must take it morning, noon and the evening, which, and throughout the whole of the qualitative data collection, there are many references to taking la, morning, noon and evening, but it's a drug that should be taken twice daily. So there's clearly knowledge gaps there. Um, and in the household survey, there weren't quite so many references, but 7% of those receiving la said three times a day instead of two and 3% of those who took DHA for Periquin said that they administered it twice a day instead of once. So it's, it's not clear how much that's to do with the speeding up the process technique and how much is to do with just a misunderstanding, but there's, there's an overlap there. Um, and again, with understanding, most understood in the qualitative um, part of the study, they understood that a vomited or spat dose should be repeated um, they didn't necessarily understand that then they'd need another one to replace that. So they would just use the next tablet in the packet, but not necessarily then go back to the health facility for a replacement dose. When it came to, so that was what they reported, the behaviour they reported. When you came to seeing what they'd actually done in the household survey, um, v v vomiting was infrequent. Um, and out of those who did report vomiting, 10 said they did nothing. So despite a general good knowledge of the importance of replacing the dose, that's not necessarily what happens. Um, one returned to the hospital and one gave another tablet without replacing it. So there may be other factors beyond understanding that, that in fact it's likely there are other factors that determine behaviour beyond understanding. And, um, and participants did explain a fear as well of forcing a child to take more medicine when the medicine is making them sick. So. We also saw this generation of theories people described that the medication may not be compatible with a particular child's blood and that was commonly stated that for a child it might be suitable but for another child it might not be. It's to do with the individual child rather than the disease or the medication itself and that has consequences particularly for underdosing or actually just lack of treatment seeking because parents said if it fails they might just seek another source of care so that might be a traditional source or what have you with the on the basis that this medication is not suitable for this particular child. And some caregivers understood that if it hadn't worked once or twice in particular illness episodes for the child, it wasn't ever going to really work for that child. So they would perhaps try other sources of care. So moving to the household survey reports of actual reported adherence during a recent FIBOL episode, there is, as I said, it was, it was a, quite a small sample. And to be honest, we weren't particularly expecting a, a massive difference between uh, LA and DHA perpetuin and we were certainly probably expecting the adherence if it was higher in one group to be higher in the LA group with the dispersible cherry flavoured rather than DHA perpetuin which is bitter but as you can see there is some suggestion although the p-value is not great that the um, adherence was actually higher to DHA perpetuin and there's some suggestion as well that adherence improves uh, with the age of the child. Maternal education didn't seem to affect overall adherence, but actually when you looked at the adherence between the two study drugs and you stratified that according to maternal education, you could see that this difference between LA and DHA appears to 
diminish with increasing education of the mother. So there is this is significant at point zero five level. There's some suggestion that the difference there's there's slightly higher adherence in the DHA preparatory group among the lower educated caregivers. So looking at the study methodology and the study overall, you have to remember that this was set within a clinical trial and that may have affected some of our study findings. There was quite a lot of community engagement going on in the area and participants may have had a, a greater understanding of the importance of appropriate treatment than they um, would have if they weren't as part of a clinical trial. There were about 40 villages across the district who were in who were included in this trial, so it was a pretty large one. Um, the medication was also dispensed by trained study clinicians who may have just spent that bit longer explaining to participants and our very high levels of information that we saw in the survey that was at 99% of people said they received instructions. That might not reflect routine care, that may have been to do with the, the trial. We also let participants know there was going to be a home visit, although we didn't let them know what it was going to be about. That may have also increased their adherence. And, um, you know, that, that knowledge of desirable behaviour may have led to an exaggeration of overall adherence. However, none of these factors should have um, altered adherence between the two study arms. The questionnaire development drew on the, the qualitative phase of the research, which was important in terms of knowing how to frame the questions around known challenges and issues with delivering medication to the the children and we saw quite honest responses in the quantitative section as well about um, methods used and the challenges and what have you so it, it showed that some level of rapport was perhaps being developed even in that structured interview. We also checked drug packaging before um, asking about adherence and most of the caregivers did produce packaging and it most of the time I haven't presented the results actually I realize now um, most of the time it did correlate with what they reported even where individuals were not um, not adherent, there were tablets remaining in the packaging. So the study um, also benefited from the mixed methods approach through just providing the rich qualitative data to support the quantitative findings. One example is the fact that in the household survey when asked about challenges with administration, almost all household survey participants, they didn't know why there were challenges. And the same thing happened with in the qualitative data collection, but then there was that opportunity for free discussion and chat, which helped them then explore this issue a bit more and describe how the bitter taste leads to this difficulty. I think it's picking that apart, though, that some children were considered to be just difficult and some children aren't so difficult, but the reason why difficult children make a fuss is because of the bitter taste and um, this also highlights that when you're trying to capture information about perceptions and understanding within a questionnaire it can be quite challenging and details will be missed. So overall in conclusion the bitter taste was reported to be a problem and that there were challenges associated with that and the consequences included loss of medication and reduced adherence. When I say loss of medication that's spilling and spitting which uh, I think I said already 24% of individuals in each arm reported spitting or spilling medication. The sweet taste seemed to reduce some of this conflict and ease the administration process, but the spitting and spilling remained the same and adherence appeared to be slightly lower than for DHA preparacrin, which requires fewer tablets. So um, what does all this mean? Uh, the health education messages in clinics should combine the pictorial instructions which are, which are on the medication with verbal instructions. There's perhaps some lack of clarity. The LA, the Coartem, the brand that's used in Malawi, the picture instruction does, if you read it left to right, it, it's not actually that. You can see why people would think it might be taken three times a day because the, the days, you have uh, day one, day two, day three, read across for the morning and then underneath you have the evening. So if you read one row and then the other row, it does look like three times a day, but if you described it verbally with participants as well as giving them the picture, that might help them understand it better. And that further optimization of antimalarial adherence requires selection of medications with simplified dosing, and also perhaps consideration of uh, alternative formulations. You can see quite a lot of new medication styles with children these days in the UK, but not so much in, in resource-poor settings. Okay, thank you very much for listening.